importance of Enoch's uh, story of the sin of the watchers for New Testament theology. Right. So there's a lot of peer-reviewed stuff. I mean, I only traffic in peer-reviewed stuff uh, on the importance of Enochian material in New Testament thinking, you know, the, the thinking of New Testament writers. So it's all over the place in terms of the scholarly world, but nobody has collected that in one volume and tried to make it decipherable just for the non-specialists. So mm. that's been the task. And I'm, I'm supposed to turn the manuscript in at the end of August, and I'm actually on pace you know, to, to uh, do that. So oh, that's it's good. Going, going well, but it's, a, it's obviously a lot of work. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big buzz on the internet these days about um, Enoch and, and other ancient literature. Uh, it's quite fascinating, really, just how much interest there is in the, in the whole, uh, whole area. Enoch would be, what, second temple period Jewish literature? Yeah, it's, it's smack, smack dab in the middle of what we'd call second temple literature, which, you know, f for folks not familiar with that term, typically the, the more popular term is intertestamental mm -hmm. uh, Jewish literature. But, you know, in technical terms, anything from roughly 500 BC all the way to, you know, 100 AD, even though, again, more precisely, the Second Temple period ended when the Second Temple, mm. you know, was destroyed in 70 AD, but scholars usually like to round the numbers off. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the, the Book of Enoch was, um, I think, it, Enoch, even though it's, it's, not, it's not in the canon, it's non-canonical, it was in the Ethiop Ethiopian uh, canon at one point, if I'm correct, is that right? Yeah, and it still is. I mean, the Ethiopian, oh, really? yeah, it's the only place you can get the entire uh, Book of Enoch is in the Ethiopic, the Gaz uh, script. Um, there, there are large portions of it that have survived in Greek, and then there's some Aramaic fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot. So, uh, you know, other than the Ethiopic, which is later um, than that other material, um, they're the only ones that, that today still, and really in antiquity, uh, there were a handful of people who argued that it should be in the canon, but the the Abyssinian or Ethiopian church was, was the only um, sort of formal... Uh, group that adopted it and still maintains that status today. Mm. And I mean, you know, it, it can be. It, it, it's a it's a topic which is not without controversy in Christian circles. When you you know even mention the Book of Enoch mm. as as something you know that you would take you take or gleam anything from. I mean, it, but it doesn't it doesn't have to necessarily be canonical to no, I, any useful. Yeah, I, I think I think the whole should it be in the canon or not question is kind of irrelevant. Uh, I don't think it's canonical, and but I don't. I really don't even think the question matters. Uh, what, what's evident, again, and this is sort of one of the things I want to illustrate in the book. It's quite evident that uh, you know if you if you knew the Enochian material well, you would be reading parts of your New Testament a bit differently. In some cases, dramatically differently, uh, because you could tell pretty quickly that New Testament writers had the Enochian material. Uh, sort of floating around in their heads. And that, again, that doesn't mean that we should assign it canonical status. What it means is that New Testament writers read the stuff and found it useful and helpful for articulating what they did uh, write down in what we have as the New Testament. Yeah, and it very much, um, it very well, I mean, if we were, you know, to suggest it had any weight at all, it, it basically focuses on, and I suppose, uh, fle fleshes out, pardon the pun, uh, Genesis 6. Um, yeah, the you know, the the Book of Enoch, roughly chapters six through sixteen, uh, are are the parts of again the Book of Enoch is what scholars refer to as First Enoch. There are actually three Enoch books. Um, the, the the second one is right on the periphery of Second Temple uh, literature, but the first one is firmly Second Temple, and it's those you know those ten or eleven chapters um, that really focus on kind of an amplification of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, uh, the whole Sons of God, Nephilim, Giants thing. And people say, well, that's just Enoch, and he's making that stuff up. Well, if, for those who have read Unseen Realm, uh, and, and I even get into it more in, in this next book, uh, that is demonstrably not the case, because what, what Enoch actually does, the Enochian material, is it preserves the original context uh, against which Genesis 6, 1 through 4 was written, 
uh, the Mesopotamian stuff uh, that goes all the way back, you know, to again biblical days and even before. And you know, there, there are there are vestiges of that original context that show up in the Old Testament, not just Genesis six one through four, but other passages. But you don't really have it sort of collected and you know systematically uh, articulated. Uh, until you get to the the second temple literature, and Peter and Jude will actually again have content about the angels that sin that you can 't find in the Old Testament. you can only find uh, in the Enochian material, uh, but that is also true you know it 's also an accurate recollection of the original Mesopotamian context so enoch 's not making material up what what happens and again this is you know, scholars would be snoozing at this point because this is like 101 for them. Uh, but th there's a there's a, a a very specific, very precise Mesopotamian context, a, a theological uh, context that prompted the inclusion of Genesis six one through four. You know, this really weird story we have uh, in in the Old Testament, and that Mesopotamian material was lost to the early church. But it was not lost to Second Temple Jews. And again, it, it, it gets lots of elements get preserved in Second Temple literature, specifically what scholars today call the Enochian material. And the New Testament writers read that stuff and it leaks out into the New Testament. I'll give you one example. Uh, we've, all heard, we've all heard of Gilgamesh, okay? Yeah, the Gilgamesh epic. Right. Well, Gilgamesh is part of this, this story, the story of the Apkalu. What if, yeah, what is the Gilgamesh epic, just for yeah. our listeners, just briefly? Well, the, the Gilgamesh epic is the story of this, you know, is, was he a historical king uh, or was he a, a mythological figure? You know, Gilgamesh who, you know, seeks to find the survivor of the flood and destroy, you know, this, this creature, you know, that, you know, in, in the Gilgamesh <laughs> epic, you know, is, is the responsibility for the flood is laid at his feet. Uh, now the Sumerian king list actually has Gilgamesh as a as a historical king, but then you get this epic that's very uh, mythological in tone. So, you know, is the is the the main character of this story real, or is he is he just myth, or is he you know a combination of history and myth? You know, who knows? But part of part of that whole complex, that whole matrix of ideas, uh, Gilgamesh is called Lord of the Apkalu. On a cylinder seal, not in the epic itself, but on a on another text from Mesopotamia, and the Apkalu story is what lurks behind the Genesis six one through four story. You know the, the the quick version here, you know without citing texts, is that the Apkalu in Mesopotamian theology, Mesopotamian religion, were divine beings before the flood. They are always and only described as divine beings, fully divine beings, and they're the ones who are responsible or accredited with giving human civilization its knowledge, uh, dispensing, you know, knowledge that the gods had to humans that uh, has good results in terms of civilization, but it also has negative results in terms of, of the way people were corrupted by it. Well, the, the Mesopotamian, you know, the, the higher ups in the pantheon uh, one day, you know, Decide well, you know, we want to get rid of humanity because they're noisy and icky, you know, and they're just they're, what, you know, what a nuisance they're, they're pests, you know. So they want to destroy humanity. Well, the Apkalu are, are a bit appalled by this, and they don't they don't like the decision, and so they they need to come up with a way to preserve their knowledge, the knowledge they gave humanity, and have it survive the flood. Uh, and so th the way they do that is again from the from the Mesopotamian material is cohabitation with humans. This is why after the flood you have some Apkalu mentioned in cuneiform tablets, but now they're not divine. Now they're only half divine. They're only they're quasi divine. They're hybrids for lack of a better term. And Gilgamesh is one of them. He's two thirds divine, one third human. He's also a giant. So in that little snippet that I just gave you, you have all of the elements of Genesis six one through four. You have you know, divine beings cohabiting with women, producing giant offspring that are hybrids, and even the knowledge element that Enoch, of course, preserves about the knowledge given by these beings to humans that are, is really, you know, the, the reason why evil proliferates uh, among the human population all over the globe is laid at the feet of the Apkalu, or again, 
the you know the the watchers, the sons of God. Watchers is Enoch's term for them. So all of this from Mesopotamia, the Genesis six one through four is is a is a biblical response to the myth that the Apkalu were good guys and this is great and they're wonderful and we should just you know be so thankful that you know they gave gave us human knowledge and we should be so thankful that they they cohabited with with women to preserve that knowledge and oh aren't they wonderful well in the, in the Mesopotamian story the greater gods specifically Marduk get gets angry at the Apkalu and and consigns them to the underworld where they shall never return again well that you also get that both in the Old Testament, where you have the the, the disembodied uh, giants, the Rephaim, who are members of, of hell. I mean, that's where they live. But you also get it in in Enochian material. You get the binding and the imprisoning idea in the underworld, and that, of course, is what Peter and Jude describe in their epistles in the New Testament. Mm. So you have a you have a really consistent picture if you if you're familiar with the Apkalu story, but the fullness of the picture is only preserved in the Enochian material, and fragments of it are preserved in the Old and the New Testament. Uh, New Testament, the, the demons of the Gospels, this is where they come from. In Second Temple Jewish literature, demons are the disembodied spirits of the, the giants, the, the, the progeny of the sons of God, the, you know, the, the sinful sons of God. So again, it's a, it's a whole matrix of ideas, and, and you can't look at, if you're familiar with the literature, which literate Jews were, in the first century, and hey, the New Testament writers are among them, they read stuff, okay? Mm. The extent of their literacy wasn't like, you know, uh, making out a bill or a receipt for the fish that I caught by the Sea of Galilee. There you go, you know, yeah. Peter. I mean, they're, they're, they're well-read. They, they know this material. They understand the context for it. And I think importantly, they don't deny uh, the supernatural nature of, of the context, um, it's part of their theology, it's part of their worldview, and that gets transmitted not only into, you know, Second Peter 2 and Jude and First Peter 3, but other places in the New Testament presuppose this Enochian description. So that's what, this, that's what the book I'm working on now is about. How, again, how it leaks into the New Testament in other less obvious places. But mm. it, it shows it was important. It doesn't matter if it's at all canonical. I, I, lo I love to go and, and present this topic about Enoch, you know, because, you know, you know, you have people in the audience, oh, we've got to have Enoch, and they can, and, you know, because, look, it, it, it's quoted. Yeah, well, so is the Baal cycle, you know, but, but most people aren't aware of the fact that biblical writers quote lots of stuff, and most of it. Nobody in that audience would want in the canon, no, you know. No, but no. but they're just not aware of the other material. So the fact that something's quoted mm. and was even found valuable yeah. is not an argument for canonicity. That that just misses the whole concept. But you know, so again, I'm trying to in inject a little sanity into the discussion. Yeah, it was important to them, and you ought to read it because then you'd catch certain things in your New Testament. You'd sort of know what to do with them, yeah. but. To, to say, oh, now we have to add this, you know, tape it to the back of our New Testament here. Yeah. That, that's just ridiculous. It would help us to understand if we put our, you know, our first century Jewish contextual hats on to try and understand right. what's... Uh, that, yeah. That's all you need to do. You know, just try to get their world in your head. Read what they read. Again, it, it'll just help you. It'll, it'll help you decipher what, what they're trying to communicate. You see from the scriptures that we have two competing... Uh, sort of agents at work here that you know that you've outlined in the um, uh, in your book, uh, the unseen realm, right from the start, where we you know we get this rebellion. John eight forty four talks about it. Year of your father the devil, where we have this adversary, both in human form and in the spiritual divine being form, where there's two things at at work here. Again, if we go back in, into biblical theology, which is what I'm trying to do in the unseen realm. As, as I'm saying, look, you know, there are disconnects with the way most Christians have been taught. There really are. Most Christians, if you asked, if you walked up to the average Christian today and you said, you know, your question was, hey, you know, wh why is the world the way it is? Why is there so much evil and, and just awful stuff? And, you know, the, this whole notion of depravity, you know, that, that, you know, people just, when they get older, you know, they just, they just, 
do bad things. We, we're, we're inherently selfish. You know. Bent towards right. wickedness. Right. We're bent towards wickedness. And the Bible even says that, you know, but why, why is that? And the average Christian would look at you and say, well, it's because of the fall. Mm-hmm. Adam and Eve in the garden. And, 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 and that's it. And, you know, put, you put a period at the end of the sentence. That's it. Well, that is not actually what biblical theology presents to us. Mm-hmm. The fall is one of three episodes. Now, the other two are, you have, this is where evil you know, begins back in, in Eden. But if you ask a second temple period Jew the same question, why is the world the way it is? Why, you know, what's going on here? They would say, well, you know, we had the first rebellion against, against God's you know, good wishes uh, back in Eden. But then we had Genesis 6, 1 through 4. We had a transgression of the spiritual world and the divine world. And there were spiritual beings who, who gave us knowledge that it, it wasn't that God never intended us to know these things, but he intended us to know them according to a certain plan and a timetable. Well, they gave us this knowledge ahead of time. And some of it was corruptive knowledge like warfare and seduction. And abortion. Right. And abortion, you know, just violence of any type. You know, they, they gave us these things. They unveiled them to us. And it corrupted humanity. So that was the second rebellion. And then the third rebellion is what happens at Babel. Okay, what happens at Babel is, you know, again, God punishes, you know, people at, at the Tower of Babel for not dispersing you know, after the flood. And, you know, God tries to cleanse the earth and, and you know, he has, has a remnant that survive. And okay, now you, I, we want you and your descendants to disperse and try to you know, make things the, the way I, I intended it to be originally. Well, they don't do that. And then God says, fine, I'm going to sever the relationship between me and you. And I'm going to put you under the authority of lesser divine beings. And they're going to be like placeholders. I mean, Paul says in Acts 17 that this was part of the plan to, you know, get the nations eventually back to the true God through the Messiah of Israel. And this is but key. He, this is key because, I, you know, in, in the um, King James Version, it said he divided up the nations by the, the uh, number of the, according to the number of the sons of Israel. But of course, there's like there's a, just a basic <laughs> chronological problem there because there was no Israel at that yeah, point. Yeah, there was no Israel. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Dead Sea Scrolls say that when the Most High divided up the nations, this is Deuteronomy thirty-two eight and nine. Yeah. Yeah. When the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Yeah, so basically, just this, this is so important for you know the bigger picture zooming out of what the whole scriptures are about. We have this rebellion with the Tower of Babel. You say here, quote in your book, the famous story of the building of the Tower of Babel is uh, about much more than an ill-fated construction project and language confusion. The episode is at the heart of the Old Testament worldview. It was at Babylon where people sought to, quote, make a name for themselves by building a tower that reached to the heavens, the realm of the gods. So then God judged this, scattered them, blah, blah, blah. And you take it from there as to them. Um, how how God then deals with His people? Sorry to interrupt, Mike. Yeah, I mean he the the it, it looks like a a firm one hundred percent divorce. You know he 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 scatters the people, he divides them up, he allots them. That's other Deuteronomy language. Deuteronomy four nineteen, Deuteronomy seventeen three, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty three through twenty six. You can trace this whole idea through Deuteronomy, and it culminates here in Deuteronomy thirty two eight nine where God divorces in humanity and says, fine, if you don't want to listen to me, I'm going to assign you and allot you to other gods, and we'll just, we'll just forget about you. But then when he, the very next thing he does in the biblical story is he takes one guy you know, out of Ur of the Chaldees, you know, Abraham. He calls Abraham and says, it's through you and through your wife, Sarah, you're, that you're, she's past being able to have children. I'm going to supernaturally recreate a people for myself. And in the, in the covenant he makes with Abraham right after Babel, it, he says, Genesis 12, 3, through you, all those other nations of the earth will be blessed, you know, ultimately. Hmm. So he doesn't forget completely about them. He's just, he's just basically said, if you, if you don't want me... I'm, I'm giving you what you asked for. Yeah, and then, <laughs> yeah, and then the, the rest of the whole testament is basically the nations and these other gods that, put, uh, that God put over them, which were, which were supposed to rule them with righteousness, but right. but led they them don't. yeah and led them into all sorts of wickedness and and God and His people um, and 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 the goods God and the good spiritual realm against this other so you've got this you know 
good and evil cosmic picture yeah, going on here. Yeah. It's a it's a hostile relationship. This is the beginning of what scholars call cosmic geography. Uh, what what the layperson would call spiritual warfare. Um, yeah, it's it's a shame. Sort of yeah, I mean, it's such a sorry to interrupt. I'm just going to say it's such a shame. You know that. You know, you you just won't. If this was taught in in the churches, you know, to kids when they get to even from like seven or eight, nine, ten years of age, they're able to grasp this. It's, you know, it's fascinating and it gives such a, you know, a general overview so that you've got some proper context and perspective when you're actually reading the rest of the Old Testament as to actually what's going on. Because I really, I don't think I understood the Old Testament in any real context until I understood this type of stuff. Well, it, it, th this is the orienting framework and it is parsable, it is decipherable, it is understandable because it's told a story. Sure. You know, and, and again, there, there's a there's a a real wisdom, you know, on, on God's part, you know, of doing that.